People talk about racism and it's so big and it permeates so much of what happens in daily life everywhere in this country, whether people understand or acknowledge it or not. The, the challenges of race, you know, what W.E.B. Du Bois talked about, the challenge of the 20th century is the color line, which is still the case today. Um, what if two people tried to understand better issues of race from the perspective of the other? So here you've got, you know, Kumbaya white guy from rural Oregon, Central Oregon, and, you know, this African-American woman from urban Southside Chicago. What if the two of us lived this model of healing together? And so that's what we attempted to do. How can we be together from such opposite sides, you know, from somebody whose ancestors were enslaved and somebody whose ancestors did the enslaving? Can we find peace together? Can we find healing? Can we grow together? through this, this process. When did you first learn about James DeWolf? Late 2000, early 2001. I was in my late 40s before I learned any of this history. He was the patriarch, I guess, or the, the most successful of the slave traders in the family. Three generations um, over about 50 years of this family was involved in the slave trade, and he was the most successful um, they brought something like 10,000 people out of West Africa and forcing them into slavery. And uh, they say something like half a million of their descendants could be alive living here today. And uh, he owned more ships than the U.S. Navy at the time. And the Navy wasn't that big, but he uh, was quite successful in the slave trade. Um, the most successful slave trading family in U.S. history in the most involved state in slave trading, uh, which was Rhode Island, responsible for more than half of all slave trading uh, from these shores. Did you have any idea that this was in your family background? Zero, zero. It, uh, it, it wasn't something that I knew, nothing that my dad knew. I mean, his father died when my dad was two years old, so if there were stories to be passed down, there was no one to, around to do that. Um, so no, it's it's nothing that I knew literally at all until the until my late forties, and then discovered not only this family history but just a tremendous amount of U.S. history that was never taught in any school I went to, and as I travel the country, it's not taught much in most schools. The first book was filled with so much horror aspects of American history that not only was I not aware of, but was understandable why I wasn't aware of. I mean, you know about slavery, you know all these terrible things, but you know, coming back and learning about my direct connection to it, the North's direct connection to it, Oregon's direct connection to histories of abuse, the KKK in Bend, Oregon, um, you know, sundown towns here, the big question for me is, what do you do with this information? What's next? And found, learned about an organization, got invited, in fact, to the first gathering of a group called Coming to the Table, which is the descendants of the enslaved and descendants of the enslavers coming together to understand and acknowledge the full history of this nation. And it was through Coming to the Table that I met Sharon Morgan in the spring of 2008. And we didn't really hit it off. It was... Uh, why, why didn't you hit it off? You know, it's funny. Um, she said that I stared at her with these piercing blue Paul Newman eyes, you know, and, and that I was just impolite or intimidating or something. And I found her intimidating and maybe a little standoffish. And we just didn't... I mean, we weren't... It wasn't anything antagonistic or rude. We just didn't hit it off. But about five months after that, I was speaking at the Redemption of Reason conference at the University of Chicago, which is where she lived. And she came to that conference just to greet me to her hometown, give me a hug. And she would say she wanted to touch this person and see if I was serious about this work because she'd read my book and um, really liked what I was doing and was really intrigued by coming to the table. Um, and so that was the moment that things began to blossom. We spent 
three years. It's still ongoing, but for the book, we spent three years visiting each other's families, getting to know each other's kids and grandkids, you know, parents, aunts, uncles, um, and really diving deeply into each other's lives. I showed her around where I grew up in Southern California and Pomona, where I grew up close to the Watts riots, and, and, and she took me through Southside Chicago, showing me all the places of her childhood. We then visited, we've been to 27 different states, visiting sites of racial terror, as well as important sites in the civil rights movement. We've been to courthouses doing genealogical research with each other's families. Um, been to plantations, antebellum homes. We spent the night in the house that was the front of Terra in Gone with the Wind. Um, went to Money, Mississippi, where Emmett Till was so brutally terrorized and murdered. Um, and, you know, went to Lawrence, Kansas, to the site of, of John Brown, the, the Battle of Blackjack, that um, was the first real battle between free state and pro-slavery forces. Um, so wanting to understand this history from the perspective of each other, we, went, we spent three weeks in Tobago, in the Caribbean, in the last of the great houses that at one time was a 600-acre sugar plantation. And wanting to kind of visit these scenes and understand history from a perspective that most people don't don't seek out. What Sharon and I committed to do is just to be really open mm -hmm. and really honest and really equal in this discussion. And, you know, I, we both brought a lot of life experience. And because of the previous, you know, eight or ten years in working, creating the film, writing my first book, and being involved with coming to the table, my awareness shifted a lot, grew a lot. And so we both brought a lot to the table um, in beginning our conversation with each other. Um, you know, a few surprises along the way. We're driving to my sister's house for Thanksgiving dinner and in Southern California. And, you know, she lives out in rural, you know, it's agricultural area, avocado trees and orange trees and and uh, when we get off the freeway, we're driving and we get on this road and it's rural, it's curvy, it's narrow, tree canopies. And, and she says to me, what if that creek floods that we just went over, is there another way out of here? And I'm like, what? I mean, it's a dry bed. It's not like there, there's a bridge over a dry bed and, and completely blue skies of Southern California. And, you know, and I said, so what are you being paranoid here? And she's like, I don't think that's funny. She said, when you're around white people, you have to be. And she explains to me how she had been taught from childhood about how to act around white people. And here she is driving into the territory of the enemy from the way she's been raised. Because, you know, in her childhood, you know, the early 1950s, prior to the civil rights movement, you know, you could die. Emmett Till died, died for his interaction with a white woman. Sharon has ancestors who've been lynched. She has ancestors who've been horribly abused, who are part of the Great Migration out of Mississippi and Alabama into Chicago because of the, 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 the fear of not just brutality and abuse and discrimination and prejudice, but the potential to die because of the color of her skin. And, you know, and I'm thinking, this is my family. Everything's going to be cool. You know, she's going to be warmly welcomed, which she was. And, you know, I would never, never think that way. And then I remembered Lindy and I on our honeymoon. And Lindy and I are really big Bruce Springsteen fans. So we were going to go to Asbury Park, New Jersey and see if we couldn't hunt down Bruce. And on our way there, between Bristol and New Jersey, is New York City. And we're driving along, and I take an exit that I think is the right one. And next thing I know, we're in Harlem. And we are driving along a street looking up at the elevated freeway far above. And my heart starts pounding because it seems like every single building is, got, is surrounded by cyclone fences with razor wire, bars in the windows, people sitting, standing, walking around, none of them white. 
some of them are staring at us, you know, and I'm like, you know, without looking at her, Lindy, don't make it obvious, but make sure your door's locked and we're not stopping to ask for directions. We just keep driving, 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 block after block after block. And I have no idea how we got back on the freeway and made our way to Asbury Park, which we did. I just remember the fear. And those are the things that Sharon and I have in common, is that fear from the opposite side. And, you know, she'll say, maybe now Tom will understand why I was nervous driving into the back of Bush, California, you know. And that was part of the, I don't know, craziness of this adventure that we agreed to go on. Um, but we also agreed to have each other's back. We agreed to, to make this happen together. You said that you understood where Sharon's fear came from. Do you know where your fear came from in that situation? To be honest with you, I think it's part of our DNA as white people. I think it's part of our DNA as black people that there is a, that there is a, a distrust that is rooted in the wounds that have been inflicted. The oppression that white people visited upon black people in this country. Um, there's wounds on both sides. I think white people, um, it may take on many, many forms. It may, it, it may take on an unconscious form where we're not aware of why it is that if I see a big black guy walking down the street, I'm gonna move to the other side of the street, even in broad daylight. Um, where if I'm a, 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 a store owner, why is it that I'm keeping an eye on the black lady down that aisle and not the white lady down that aisle? Um, why is it that uh, black kids are getting stopped in cars off the charts more often than white kids are getting stopped in cars, you know, driving down the street, you know. Um, I, I think that with white people, what, what, what we've inherited is a sense of distance, a sense of unease built sometimes on shame, sometimes on fear, sometimes on just discomfort that is rooted in traumatic separation based on wounds that have been inflicted and that when you when you study trauma which is part of the this whole model of healing is understanding trauma as a wound that if it's not healed it continues to fester and we tend to go back and forth through these cycles of violence and they may be psychological or physical or sociological um, but there there's a cycle of acting out aggressively against others and a cycle of acting in towards oneself and it may be drugs and alcohol it may be abusing one's spouse or abusing someone who is the other um, physically or psychologically or just the separation and we get caught up in these cycles and if we don't find a way to break out and move into a, a, a healing journey then we're stuck there and we pass that on to our kids. I absolutely know that it's a topic that people can talk about but we don't because we don't deal with it in the way that we deal with most subjects that impact us. But if, in fact, we will make the effort to understand issues of race and work together on them, you know, this coming to the table model that Sharon and I lived and wrote about in our book is one that exists because people are doing this work together. And it's understanding the impact of this historic trauma on us today and present day circumstances, present day consequences that we uh, can have and should have. You know, it's like when Attorney General Eric Holder a few years back said, when it comes to issues of race, we are largely a nation of cowards. But until we start having these conversations with each other and accepting that we won't always say the right things, but we need to work on these things together, until we do that, we are never going to become the nation that we were supposedly founded on, the ideals that we were founded on. You know, and, and Eric Holder was taken to task by people on the right and the left and by his boss, by President Obama. But he's exactly right. And this, you know, through coming to the table, uh, this conversation is happening. And it's not, I mean, it's happening in many other contexts as well. This just happens to be the group that, um, you know, Sharon and I are connected with and that um, we wrote about and 
you know, people are finding out through our book, which we're really grateful for when it shows up in, you know, we'll show up at a college classroom and, and somebody's brought their book and it's filled with sticky notes. We know that it's making an impact and, and people are recognizing that we're hungry for the conversation and we're willing to have it.